His message talks to us a little bit about how we deal with our fears in life. A lot of fear in the world right now, and uh, you know this is an unprecedented time. Never in my lifetime have I seen the country, the nation, the world uh, going through the turmoil it is, and so much fear, so much concern, so much out uh, unknown about what is going on in our world today. And I want to do this message looking at Exodus 14, uh, talking about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt and how God worked miracles in their life and how he relieved their fear. And he can and will relieve our fear also. So if you have your Bibles and want to turn to Exodus 14, we're going to look at the first 14 uh, verses. And you can always stop this and get the, get your uh, Bible together and then uh, pick back up. But I want to read this is from the New King James Version. <clears throat> says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they may turn and camp before P Piara, between Megdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, They are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled. The heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have they done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariots and took the people with him. And he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them all with their horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, and his army, and overtook them by camping by the sea of P. Haroth, between Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel looked, lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were very afraid, just like we are now. We see this coronavirus coming upon us, and we're very afraid of what's going on. It goes on to say, the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that was told to us in Egypt, saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. I ask you to join me in a time of prayer. <clears throat> Father God, we lift up this time to you, and I just pray you bless each person that is listening today, that you watch over, God, protect their lives. Lord, we're going through a time where uh, your children are concerned about what's going on in our world, in our nation, in our city. We're fearful. We are hearing things that uh, this virus is, uh, can be very deadly, very contagious. And I just pray that, uh, dear God, you give us a, a piece about this. Let us remember that you are in charge. Just as you told Moses, you would tell us not to be afraid, uh, Lord, that to, to stand and watch your deliverance. And we pray for that deliverance. We pray that you come against this virus in our nation, in our world, and that you protect your people, that you guide and direct in every situation. And Lord, as we go through this message today, we give you the glory and honor for all things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Pharaoh had finally given Moses permission to lead the people out of Egypt. But once they started on their journey, uh, Pharaoh had uh, changed his mind. He realized that he'd lost the services of tens of thousands of these slaves. And without that pool of free labor, his own people would have to go back to work. So Pharaoh assembled his army and set out after the Israelites. The Israelites had come to the bank of the Red Sea to set up a camp. 
and all of a sudden, they noticed the army approaching more than 600 chariots in full pursuit. And you can just imagine what they were going through as they turned and they heard the roar of the chariots hitting their way, the dust that they could see. And there they were in a place where their backs, so to speak, were against the wall, and fear was rampant. They began to realize that they were facing an impossible situation with no possible means of escape. In front of them was the Red Sea. Behind them was the Egyptian army, and they had nowhere to run. It appeared their only options were to be killed in battle or drowned trying to swim across the sea. Seemingly, they had painted themselves into a corner, and things looked absolutely hopeless. But here's the thing. They were right where God wanted them to be. And that's something that's important for us to remember, too, in our life. Today, we're going to look at how to deal with situations that seem impossible. We're all facing an unprecedented enemy called the coronavirus. Our president has called this virus an unseen enemy, causing fear and havoc to control our lives. And as I said before, I cannot remember in my lifetime anything similar that has happened like this to have such an impact on our nation. And many of you here today may be feeling fearful, and you do not know what to do, but I want to give you five spiritual truths in this story that we are looking at today that can help us hang on, five principles that will give us information to guide us safely across when we're faced with an impossible situation. The number one thing, if you want to write these down, please do recognize God's purpose for the situation. Recognize God's purpose for the situation. The events in your life do not happen by accident. God is in control of everything. I believe that with all my heart. Our God is in control of everything that happens on this earth. He has a purpose for bringing the Israelites to this Red Sea, and he has a purpose for this coronavirus too, even though we may not understand it at this time. He wants to accomplish two things. He wants us to make known his glory, And he wants to teach us to trust him more. The Bible says in Exodus 14, 4, I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And you know how this story ends. I don't think I'm giving away anything here by telling you. Eventually, the water of the Red Sea parts and the Israelites walk across to safety. And that was all part of God's plan because as a result of this experience, the Bible said, thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. The situation we're facing today serves a purpose. God can use this situation we're going through in our nation today to glorify himself and to strengthen the bond between you and him. You can come through this ordeal with faith stronger than you've ever had before. And I believe this is God's purpose for our life. In 1996, Dr. David Jeremiah went to his physician for an executive physical. This is where a physician gives you a good going over physically, checking your blood and lungs and et cetera, your heart. And when he came back at the end of the day, he got his results. When uh, he went in, the physician told him that something did not quite look right in his abdominal cavity, and he was going to send him for some further tests. A few days later, the diagnosis came back, and it was, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Dr. Jeremiah said that when he heard the news, he really did not know what to do. The doctor performed surgery and began chemotherapy, and the cancer went into remission. But two years later, in 1998, the cancer came back, and they began more extensive treatments, which left him cancer-free now for almost 20 years. Dr. Jeremiah was concerned about his family, his ministry, his future, The good news is that God was not finished with him, and he says now at the age of 79, he is busier than ever. His message to the congregation when he returned after his ordeal said, Folks, I want you to listen to this very carefully. God is enough. He's enough for every situation you faced. He was enough on the cross through his son Jesus Christ to pay for your sin, and he is enough to take you all the way to heaven. And when you go through the difficult things you're facing in your life right now, if you know him, he's enough. And as we face unknown futures right now, remember that God has a promise for you to glorify himself and to teach you to trust him more. I believe a lot of things that happen in our life are for these very reasons that God wants us to know we can call upon him. We can rely upon him. He loves us and wants to take care of us, but he wants us to recognize him 
as our Lord and our God. Number two thing that we need to think about is we need to retain God's perspective on the situation. When the Israelites looked up and saw the Egyptian army approaching in the distance, do you know that their immediate response was panic? The Bible says they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us to die in the wilderness? This is verse 11. It's amazing uh, that they had this attitude considering how they had witnessed the power of God in Egypt, but they had already forgotten that uh, all of that God had done for them and was convinced that this was the end. They went on to say it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. That's in verse 12. And I suppose they're right. It would have been better to be a slave in Egypt than to die in the desert. But God did not intend for them to do either. He had plans for them, plans greater than they could imagine. And of course, they weren't going to die in the desert. The Egyptians didn't intend to kill them. They probably really wanted to take them back to be the slaves again that they were before. But all this shows our tendency to lose God's perspective on the situation. Too often, we're confronted with an impossible situation. And rather than meet it head on, we take the easy way out. We say, we don't want to face our Red Sea. We don't want to face Pharaoh's army. So let us just go back to the way things were before. But God doesn't want that. He doesn't want you to settle for second best. He doesn't want you to run for a crisis. He wants you to meet it head on with courage and convictions that he will send us through. Homer Hickman was a young kid growing up in the West Virginia coal mine town in 1957. In those days, in that town, young men didn't have very much options. They either got a college scholarship on football or they ended up working in the coal mines for the rest of their life. Well, unfortunately, Homer was hopelessly non-athletic, but he loved science. Homer had a passion for building rockets. He and some friends began conducting ex experiments, trying to develop rockets that would fly. As the experiments became successful, the boys began to believe in the possibility of winning the state science fair, which could lead to a college, college scholarship. And the ticket out of their life through this coal from coal mining. Homer's dream fell apart when his father was injured. And he had a serious mining accident. Homer had no choice but to quit school and go to work. It was his father's ex expectation for him to do that, to take care of the family. It is what the principal of the school expected him to do and what most people in life expected him to do. Forget your dream, take the easy way out, and go work in the mines. Homer's dad was a miner. He loved being a miner, but Homer had a different interest. He wanted to design rockets, but this dream seemed to be hopelessly out of his reach. He found himself facing a decision. He could either remain a slave in a dying coal mining community, or he could look at life from a different perspective, and that was to... Uh, designed him for greatness. Homer made his choice. As soon as his father recovered from his injury, he quit the mines, went back to school. He entered and won the state science fair and then took his exhibit to the World's Fair in Indianapolis and won that too. He was offered a full college scholarship and today Homer is a NASA engineer. There was a time when things seemed hopeless and he was tempted to go back to his Egypt, but he learned to look at life from another perspective. The coronavirus we're fearful about today is not the impasse that you and I think it is. God has a better plan. He wants you to look at the big picture. He wants you to look at life from his perspective. He will get us through any impossible situation. And our third point I want to make today is that we need to rely on God's promises. Rely on God's promises. A motivational speaker was once asked, if your success was guaranteed, wouldn't you be willing to endure just about anything? If you had an ironclad contract stating that if you dig ditches in the rain every day for six months, you could have a complete financial freedom after that, wouldn't you be willing to dig ditches? And the answer was, of course. We can endure just about anything if we know the outcome. However, one of the most difficult aspects of facing a challenge is dealing with feelings of hopelessness and helplessness. When you all see in the newspapers, the television, the radio, just how bad things might get, it's just too much to feel confident about our future. And when you're facing a Red Sea like uh, Moses and the children of Israel were, you've got to rely on God's promise. What is his promise? Here's what he said in verse 13 and 14. 
do not be afraid. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. God promised two things. He promises to take care of your problem. He said, the Egyptians you see here today, you'll never see again. We have a tendency to put a Band-Aid on our problems, to sweep them under the rug, to get them out of the way for a few days. But God promised to remove it once and for all. Also, he promises to fight for you. Without God's help, the Israelites didn't have a chance, and neither do we. We need him in the battle. He promised to be there for us, to fight on our side. And to get to the other side of the Red Sea, you have to learn to rely on his promise. What does it mean to rely? Once again, let's look at verse 13 and 14. Relying on God's promises involves three different things. First, he said, don't be afraid. These words appear in the Bible more than 50 times. Do not be afraid. And that means that you can choose to not be afraid. Of course, no one ever chooses to be afraid. Fear just pounces on us. But when it pounces, you and I can choose to reject it. Number two, he said to stand still. Don't compromise your integrity. Don't give up. Don't run. Don't hide. Stand and face your situation. And number three, hold your peace or be still. Moses is not talking about our bodies. He's talking about our heart. Being still involves blocking out all distractions and placing our focus on the promise of God, or even better, focusing on God himself. Remember this, the peace of God can't hit a moving target. If you want to be filled with God's peace, your heart will have to become still long enough to receive it. As you face this fearful situation in your life, with the enemy seeming to close in from behind us, rely on God's promise to see you through. Also, here's something else you need. We need to rest in God's protection. When the Israelites first began their journey, they were led by a cloud by day and a fire by night. When they arrived at the bank of the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army began closing in, the cloud moved behind the Israelite camp between the Israelites and the Egyptians. The Bible tells us in verse 20 of this text, it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it was light and night by the other, so that one did not come near the other all night. God had not yet performed the miracle that would deliver the Hebrew people. That would come later. Until then, they could rest still on God's protection. And here's an interesting verse. Verse 19 says, The angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. This angel withdrew. And how do you think the Israelites reacted when they saw the cloud begin to float away? Undoubtedly, like you and I are prone to do, they thought, there it goes. We're sunk. God is leaving us now all to our own. It may have appeared that way at first, but the cloud moved behind them to protect them during the night. As you face impossible situations in your life, there's something we all need to keep in mind, no matter how bad things seem. Things are not as bad as they could be. And the reason they're not as bad as they could be is because God is preventing things from getting that bad. The phrase, things could be worse, is usually set up for a joke. But this is not a joke. We're looking at a situation with the eyes of faith, and you will now and see how God has kept his hand on you in spite of difficulties. He's protecting you, and you now will do that, or he will continue to do that until the day he parts the sea for you. In 1960, Cuban Christian Armando Valadares was arrested for offenses against state authorities. Specifically, he was caught praying in church. Can you imagine that? Immediately, Valadares was sent to a prison for the next 22 years, was subjected to cruelty, torture that is common in Castro's prison system. He was expecting to die there. The government didn't plan to release him, and the Christians in Cuba had no hope of seeing him again. Things looked hopeless, but God protected this man. He survived. Christians and human rights organizations throughout the world lobbied for his release. And finally, in 1982, Valadares was set free until the day 
that his Red Sea parted. God had protected him from his enemies. He kept him alive. He emerged from prison with a bold faith and a powerful testimony. God is protecting you too. Rest in his protection and you will face un imaginable situations, situations that we cannot comprehend how we're going to get out of, but we know that God's going to be there with us. And lastly, I want us to think about this, reaching for God's power. This is what God said to Moses in verse 16, lift up your rod, the rod that is in your hand, stretch it out over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go forward on dry land through the midst of the sea. God wants to deliver you from an impossible situation. This coronavirus, maybe not just this, but other things, financial concerns, health concerns, other things that will pop up in our lives, we need to realize that God is there to deliver us. He wants to be part of this process. He wants to be involved in all decisions, for it is to happen only when we stretch out our hand and reach for God's power. And that staff that Moses carried symbolizes God's power in his life. When God first called Moses, you may remember, he said to Moses, throw down that staff that's in your hand, and that staff became a serpent. He told Moses to pick it up, and it became a rod again. Moses and Aaron each used their staff to bring plagues upon Egypt. The staff was waved over the Nile, and the Nile turned to blood. The staff was stretched over the streams, and the plagues of frogs were sent. The staff was struck to the ground, and the plagues of gnats swarmed the land. The staff was stretched to the sky, and hail rained upon Egypt, and on and on. The staff wasn't magic, but it symbolized the power of God. God was saying to Moses, you hold my power in your hand. If you're willing to reach, you will again witness a miracle. And I want us to understand and believe that God's power is available to us too. If we're willing to reach, if we're willing to stretch forward our hands, we can experience a miracle, a miracle from God, getting to the other side of our Red Sea. And it requires us to reach, to move in faith like you've never done before, to trust God more than you ever have before, to take a bolder step than you've ever stepped out before. And I don't know what seemingly impossible situation we may face other than this coronavirus. This is a horrible thing that is coming upon our, our nation, upon our world. But I know this, if you reach for God's power, he will supply it and he will get us all through to the other side. Remember, this coronavirus only seems like the end of the road. God has a plan. It may be something different than that for you that you ever even imagined, but he has a plan. He will get you to the other side. And when he does, you can be sure that others will see his glory in your life and in your relationship with him and will become stronger than ever before. You're not on your own. You don't have to fight this enemy on your own. You have the ability to conquer through the power of Almighty God. And that power is right within our reach. It is my prayer for all of us listening today that God will miraculously protect and watch over and guide each of you. I pray, Father God, that you lift us up, that you help us to know that you are God, that you give us the strength to realize that you are in control of this virus, this situation, all elements of our world. And Father, we can rely on you. Just when our situation seems impossible, Lord, that's when you step forward and you show us that we can depend totally and completely on you. Lord, I pray for your deliverance in this situation. I pray for peace for our people. I pray for strength to get through this. And I pray for hope that in the end, we will see your glory exemplified through this situation. And our nation will be stronger than ever. And one thing can happen. Your name will be lifted high above all things. Thank you, O oh God, for this. Bless our people and lift this up in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.